don't know what's happened to our rug. Uh, it's possible we had to sell it to buy a new roof. <laughs> well, the story of Jacob's ladder, as it is found in the Old Testament, opens quite a field of inquiry. We can't really hope to cover all the aspects of it, but we want to bring out a few of the points which have a bearing, perhaps, upon our own futures. In the first place, science today is, is completely physical, not only in its attitudes, but in its areas of activity. It assumes that the physical world as we see it, with the attendant new celestial phenomena, is the reality. The physical th problems are real. Everything else is speculation of some kind. Now we go further and further out into space. We come in contact with a variety of previously unknown phenomena, but it's all physical. It is all some kind of expansion to be conquered by scientific advancements, by the creation of newer and improved instruments of investigation, and by continual recognition of the scientific method. Without this method, we are seriously handicapped. Now, in anthropology, we are having a little trouble now with method, too, because the Darwinian theory is falling apart, and no one knows what to put in its place. But regardless of what we do, we are working in physical matter with physical instruments surrounded by something we don't understand. To the material scientist, the physical existence extends to the ultimate, absolute extremity of conditioned existence. It goes on and on and on beyond all the solar systems and all the nebulae that we can possibly imagine. But everything is physical. It is all to be estimated by the vision of the beholder supported by scientific equipment. So here we have a rather interesting problem. We'll take a chart, for instance, supposing we have a picture that a scientist takes of the solar system. We have numerous such pictures. They have them in all the observatories and planetariums and all these places. It looks like it's just a flat map with one circle after another representing the orbits of planets with various markings to indicate certain six stars that are valuable. But all of these markings are on a flat surface. They're in one or two dimensions at most. And in this two-dimensional locking of pictographs of various kinds, we get no assurance or insight into what lies beyond. The ancients had one up on us they recognized that there was something we didn't see, that we couldn't see under normal conditions, and that the visible universe is only a manifestation or a tail end appendage of something infinitely greater. Now, this infinitely greater has up to now defied scientific investigation, although every once in a while somebody lifts a corner of the mystery, takes a quick look, and drops the corner again. We do not know exactly what is out there, but it is becoming more evident that there is something beyond what we can see. If there is something that we can't see, then we are not in the c condition to come to final estimations of the world is in which we live. If we cannot see beyond the physical, and there is something beyond the physical, it becomes more or less probable that whatever that is that we don't see is the cause of that which we do see. This is an irritating thought, but the, still you can't completely disregard it. So we come to the idea that the ancients had, and we had ourselves down to the time of Copernicus and Galileo, that the physical universe was only a small part of creation that the rest of it was just as real, but not 
within the range of our sensory perceptions under normal conditions. Occasionally, someone with an extra sense has brought back information of great interest, but it wasn't possible to settle it down into science because it was another dimension and would not fit into the two-dimensional world of modern physical research. So gradually, there has come about a, re a restoration of certain aspects of ancient learning. We are beginning to recognize that there were many very admirable scholars in, an in ancient times who, if they were not psychic, at least had trained the intellect to the recognition of certain values. Now, to train a mind is very important, but what you train it for is still more important. If you train a mind to see only the visible, that is all that it will see. If we train the mind, however, to believe and to see that which is outside of physical matter, something that is not immediately tangible to the objective sight, then we can perhaps rationalize on a number of important points. And that the ancients did a great deal of this rationalization. Without the instruments, without we, we could not function. Without the background of centuries of research, they did some of the most important basic thinking we have in the world of science. Pythagoras with his mathematics and Ptolemy with his astronomy were true great pioneers in the search for the facts about existence. Now, if we take it for granted that the physical world is only a part of something, that it is only the physical manifestation of a vast invisible structure, the, the thought is not as bewildering as one might think. Even physically, the magnitude of the universe is inconceivable. And if we wish to recognize that it is just more inconceivable than we thought, there will be a certain amount of interest on the matter. Now, in the ancient world, we find a gradual development of a law of analogy. As above, so below. As in the heavens, so on, or in the, on the earth. As in the sky, so in the body of man. As it is in the universe, so it is on the strings of a violin. The colors, the elements, everything we know are in orderly sequences. There is a tremendous series of symbols, each symbolizing not only itself but other things. And this was developed strongly in Asia and also strongly by the mystics of the Middle Ages in Europe. It suddenly became obvious to some at least that the universe was a great being and that man was a miniature universe. This analogy uh, was the basis of most early research, and it is this analogy that has gradually faded away under the pres pressure of intense visualization of material things. Yet the body of man is not all of man, or he would not be worth considering. The body of the universe cannot be all of the universe or it would not exert invisible laws upon visible things. Everywhere there is an indication that there is something beyond, something behind, and something greater than that which can be captured by the physical sensory perceptions. So this brings us now into the story of the ladder. The ladder, of course, is one of the most ancient symbols that we find in the religions of the world. The ladder of Jacob, upon which the angels ascended and descended, is only one of many examples. The same concept as that occurs in the Revelation of John, where we find suddenly the universe stratified into various levels and layers. We remember the night journey of Mohammed to heaven from the rock Moriah, where he goes through the orbits of the seven planets, and they become the steps of the ladder. We find Ishtar descending through the seven gates to rescue Amos, the divine in man. We find in the mystics of the Middle Ages, the Rosicrucians, the alchemists, the Kabbalists, always a strange and wonderful story about this septenary mystery of life. We find it in, even in Homer's Odyssey, 
We find it in China, in India, in Greece, in Egypt, in Persia. We find it everywhere. This mysterious idea of verse, the layers of which are the steps of a gigantic ladder. Now this ladder, if we are to believe Hermes, the great uh, Egyptian uh, mystic, the thermaturgist, of whom, whose life nothing is known. But anyway, in his t emerald tablet, Hermes declares that the above is like the, like the below, the superior is like the inferior, the lesser is like the greater, the greater is like the lesser. All things follow one immense pattern, and if anyone can break the mystery of that pattern in any one point, any one level, he has the key to the whole mystery. So for centuries men sought this key. Some believe they found it. There are many strange records of such discoveries. But gradually, the majority of human beings became dis discouraged, disillusioned. Locked within the band of sensory materialism, they gradually came, in the end, to a blind mystery. They could go so far and no further. And that which they sought faded away into the unknown. So to save themselves from the continual frustration on this level, most thinkers have finally decided to accept the physical universe as the great mystery and spend the ages now and to come trying to solve step by step the chemistry, the mathematics, the electronics of the universe. Now, in this particular point, we have two very great texts to work with. We have a realization of this in the complete miniature of life, which we call the human being. It has always been held in mysticism that the human being was a miniature of life, that anyone who could completely solve man could solve all other things. But at the moment, no one really seems to be that interested in solving man. The great purpose today is to fit man into the economic empire which we have created in this world. It is not what a man is that counts now. It's what he's worth by the hour. It is not really an effort to unfold the mystery of the internal of the human being, but merely to find remedies for his external ailments and to do what we could to extend his material existence. All of these things were secondary, but they became a primary, as individuals were disappointed one after another when they tried to explore the invisible causes of life. But in the philosophies of most nations, there has been this recognition uh, that the solar system, the human body, and space itself are identical in law, identical in principles, differing only in magnitudes and that we can explore them a little more carefully if we so desire. The uh, Ptolemaic system of astronomy gradually verged into astrology because astronomy had to do with what you did in this world, but very often it was inadequate. Astrology was not capable of solving the mysteries of human destiny. It could only proclaim them or occasionally make a dramatic interpretation of some event. But actually, the astrology of the ancients was a form of psychology. As, as, as uh, astronomy is a science, so astrology was a psychological philosophy. It had to do not with the visible forms of the solar system, but with principles mathematically, scientifically, and hieroglyphically set forth. These uh, researchers, particularly those of Ptolemy of Alexandria, probably one of the first greatest astronomers, these researchers were not primarily intended for prognostics. They were an effort to find out how the universe functioned, where all things come from, why and where they are going. And in order to do this, a new concept of the universe was gradually brought into existence. There is a very fine example of this concept in the Nuremberg Chronicle of 1498. This was the first encyclopedia and the first book of general knowledge 
and the very beginning of it is this picture of the universe as it was to these people mingling what they knew of science but what was not yet scientific and therefore got themselves labeled as superstitious fools by the more accurate modern researchers. So all the work of these older ones has been more or less downgraded simply because it is assumed that they were not, had not sense enough to be materialists and that the materialism was the final proof of intelligence. Well, we're in a little bit of a bind right now on this point. We're not at all sure today that materialism is the sole solution of anything. It only seems to complicate things until no one can solve them. But now we go to the picture of the universe, as it was in the Nuremberg Chronicle and in early editions of astronomical astrological works which preceded Kepler and Tycho Brahe. And we find what? We find a series that looks like of interrelating circles, looking very much like the rings of a target. These rings were concentric, and in ancient times, the earth was placed in the center. And around the earth, in rings, uh, were the orbits of the seven planets of that time, of which really only five were actual planets. The Chinese had somewhat similar designs, but preferred to use squares and triangles. But this uh, target-like solar system was the Placidian system of ancient days. It, continue, it began on the face of the earth and the, a line, a ladder, ascended from the surface of the earth to the extremity of the solar system, which to these people was the planet orb of Saturn. Above Saturn, they had the Empyreum, uh, bordered on the inner head, the world of the heavenly realms and regions, the abodes of deity. Therefore, there were these seven rings, concentric circles, ascending in order from the face of the earth through the orbits of the moon, and then Mercury, then Venus, then the sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, and finally Saturn. This was the target-like design, which for hundreds of years completely satisfied the needs of a world devoted to inward growth rather than to scientific uh, complications. Now this target-like device with its various rings inspired a number of useful uh, discoveries. Apparently it impelled Pythagoras to discover the octave or the mystery of musical harmony. It permitted him also to discover the principal chords and by stretching a thread or cord from the face of the earth to the upper end of the orbit of Saturn, he created a cosmic musical instrument. This has been reproduced in design and with diagrams of many values by Robert Flood, the English Rosicrucian of the 17th century. Also, Flood then took this design and laid it on the human body and came to the conclusion that the sevenfold division of Pythagoras was equally applicable to the physical structure of the human being, not only his composition, but his actual physical body. Little by little, therefore, this septenary system took over as a means of discovering the essential pattern behind life, to find out, if possible, what was good and what was evil, what was real, what was unreal, what was honorable, what was false. All of these things were involved in the seven deadly sins, the seven cardinal virtues, one of which in each case was attributed to the planets. So they made a kind of moral universe by bringing all the moralities of life into the planetary structure. They also divided it into areas for continents. They divided the oceans from the land. They created the octave and set up the frets to dis discover the upper and lower octaves of music. They created a scale of sound, a palette of seven colors. They developed all types of septenaries, and these septenaries are still more or less valuable. They knew the seven senses. They also knew the seven psych psychic powers of the human being. Everything was developed from a grand diagram. 
And when that diagram came down to us as on a flat sheet of paper with the orbits of the planets and the elements indicated and the empyrean or the divine realms above, the modern astronomer looked at it for a moment and said, it's, it's rubbish. It's not the way solar is at all. This isn't it. This is pure fiction. Well, it may not be fiction for the reason that reality may not be physical. And no matter how far we go or how many super uh, uh, planets or, uh, or parts of the universe we discover, uh, we may not have the answer. So instead of ridiculing this old idea, some have taken it and created from it formulas for the reconstruction of life. Now, we know that the ancient mysteries were the sacred institutions of knowledge. They were the universities. They were the uh, gymnasium of education. They were all things to those who sought to know. So these ancient institutions accepted disciples into their structure by a system of rites or ch tests called initiation. And now, in uh, most cases, these initiations were seven in number, and they advanced from the material to the most abstract. They formed the rungs of a ladder of growth, a ladder of unfolding internal potentials. The disciple ascended the ladder by overcoming the negative attributes of each of the seven planets. He learned how to use knowledge and not abuse it. He learned to understand the difference between love and lust. He sought so sought to understand the difference between education and knowledge. These things gradually developed in many countries. In, uh, in Babylonia, the goddess Istar descends through the seven gates to rescue the dying at Atas or Adonis. The seven different levels like, Mo, like uh, Muhammad climbing the seven rungs that fell from the sky but which led him up to the uppermost and at each of the seven gates was one of the seven patriarchs of the Old Testament. But when he came to the seventh gate, so strangely enough, in a Muslim book, the guardian of that gate was Christ. Now all this has something to do with astronomy because the, the ancient charts show these gates as parts of the orbits of the planets, the psychological universe lying behind the literal one. We find everywhere in the mysteries of Mithras, the steps, the Mithraic uh, philosophy reached Great Britain, and there still in the, uh, in the great houses of parliament and law are the symbols of the ancient rites. The Templars' headquarters in London was a place of initiation with seven steps. All of these things remind us that these steps represent qualities. These qualities each rotates around its own sun. The emotional universe rotates around the uh, uh, intellectual, uh, mercurial world. Everything works in an orderly manner. Now we go into the human body, and this is what the Buddhists call the mysterious cave of seven parts. The seven parts are the organs of the human body recognized by the ancients. These seven vital organs are, are strengthened and intensified in their functions by the contributions of seven endocrine glands. Every part of the system works together, and to get a key to one part comes far towards opening all the rest of the mystery. We know that some of it has even uh, reached into modern anatomy in names and words. We know about the peyomata in the brain, the thin, a gentle, a kindly mother. We know also that the upper uh, axis of the sp spine where it joins the skull was known even in science as the pyramid. All kinds of strange things. The spinal column with its 33 segments still corresponding with the degrees of the ancient mystery systems. So we have all kinds of things to think about relating to this ascent from the superficial to the essential. 
This descent, which is a mystical experience, as John expresses it in the Revelation. The Revelation of John is almost a completely Gnostic work, dealing with initiations into the Gnostic rites. John is picked up and carried through the spheres and comes finally to the gates of the Empyrean. And there the upper world is revealed to him. All of this was part of the philosophy of antiquity. Now we can come back to the modern world and we can say, but there doesn't seem to be any proof of this. There doesn't seem to be any reason why uh, we should expect to find something strange and mysterious at the top of this mysterious ladder that we, are talk about, we talk about climbing. The ladder that was known to be pointing up to what the Egyptians called the Jewel of Seven Stars, which formed a constellation at the head of the ladder. All this was part of something. Here we have in India the mystery of the seven chakras aligned along the sympathetic parts of the gangliated structure. We also find the mysterious yogas, seven yogas, tied into these seven gangliated centers. Everywhere seven, seven days of creation, and all these things tie into something that we are trying to put together to find out what kind of a world we live in. For a long time, it didn't really mean too much to us. We were getting along pretty well. Uh, the Bible told us that we would live 70 years. Well, when they came time to translate the Old Testament, the, uh, the high priest Eliezer selected 70 elders to make the translation. And the first translation of the Jewish Bible is called the Septuagint, or the work of the 70. Every time you look around, you find 70. You find some reason for it. Now, in some cases, it is obvious that it is arbitrary. But it can't be arbitrary in all cases because it ties into too many vital facts that we know in our daily experience. We know the octaves of elements just as truly as we do them in music. So out of all of this, there comes this vague suspicion that there might be some way of breaking through this mystery to find out something about the reality of ourselves. Even o old Omar in his Rubaiyat describes that he went through the orbits of the planets and sat upon the throne of Saturn. Everywhere we have this same analogy, east, west, north, and south, and it means something. We know the ancients recognized seven races. They also recognized seven continents. All the way through, the septenary had to hold true. Now, what does that mean, perhaps, in our own thinking today? Suppose we assume that the individual himself has a septenary of faculties, that he has various levels of, un of insights, that he has various ways of measuring things, and that all these, except the visible faculties, are invisible, that somewhere there must be an answer it is not possible to assume religiously that this creation is without a, a cause. And it is not uh, possible scientifically to prove to a, at any degree of inclusiveness that everything that exists is merely an accident, that things just happened. Things don't just happen because there are too many evidences every day that things happen according to rules. And today there are many, many people who have experienced what we would commonly call miracles, simply because they intuitively kept the facts of life straight, whereas somebody else had mixed it up for themselves. So we have this problem of trying to understand the rights of the mysteries, how to penetrate into this structure and see why it answers all questions if we find out the key to them. Now, the key it begins with a very simple point. It begins with the earth. The earth is the foundation upon which the ladder rests. And in man, the physical body is the foundation upon which the ladder of his spinal cord and column rests. It is also true that this physical situation that we have is the beginning of something that all through the universe there is an interplay of various forces and factors. The other planets of the solar system certainly have mutual influence on each other. 
Therefore, the whole universe is one tightly tied bundle of processes. There is nothing accidental, incidental, or unimportant in this process. It is a complete integration of purposes. Now, for man, what is the purpose? Why is he settled here? Why is he in the problems he's in today? And why are these problems being pressed upon him to the point of his final solution of them? The answer is that man is here, like everything else in the universe, to grow. There is a purpose for him. The life of man is not merely a brief interlude between the cradle and the grave. The individual, by being born, living, and finally casting off this body, is not merely an accident of nature. It is not simply something that happens. And this is equally true when you study the cross-section of the eye of a fly, a magnificent mathematical pattern. That pattern is not an accident. Uh, procreation is not an accident. Growth, maturity, the release of all kinds of attitudes and processes in our own thinking, these are not all accidents. The main problem, the greatest cause of accidents probably that we have is that we have been gradually trained to ignore the testimonies that would lead us in the direction of truth. We are trained to be materialistic. If we do not believe that life is a vast futility, we are out of harmony with contemporary thinking. All other idealists are therefore merely dreamers, hoping, fearing, wondering. But the facts are that the physical universe alone is real. This is no longer tenable. We can't do it and face the national problems we have. We cannot understand the reason for ourselves until we discover that there is a reason for everything. We cannot solve the problems of government until we fit them into the great septenary pattern of existence. The final seven laws that govern life must be adapted to the seven rules which co govern a nation or a community or finally the individual himself. All these things are part of an inflexible design. To ignore it is simply to suffer. It could give us answers, but if we do not search for those answers, we are simply victims of what we like to call accidents. There are no accidents. Everything has some reason for it. Something has happened to make it necessary. Now this is what the ancient Hindus called the wheel of necessity, that we are all on a cyclic pattern of needs, of things we have to learn and things we have to do. And there is no graduation from this school until we do what we ought to do and find out the answers to the things that we must know. Otherwise, we are always going to fall short of that which is necessary to release us from the painful cycle of necessity. Necessity has only one solution, one remedy, and that is to accomplish that which is necessary. Once we keep fact with necessity, all other things will come into order. Now today in world affairs there are necessities. These we are carefully ignoring because they interfere with our personal objectives. And yet we are going along, breaking rules and suffering, and blaming it all upon the fact that there are no rules, that everything is just a long tra trail of accidents, and that we will sometime join the past with its 7,000 years. Actually, we have to begin to think of a lawful universe. Now, if a lawful universe exists, its laws must be susceptible of discovery. It must be possible to solve things if the universe has patterns that require solution and demand solution. Nothing is impossible as long as we become aware of what we are trying to accomplish. And if we accomplish correctly, a great many of our problems become minimal. And most of the things we worry about today, crime, poverty, narcotics addiction, alcoholism, all these things will cease if the individual becomes aware of the rules of life. 
Now, of course, we make laws physically to inhibit crime, to limit or restrict disasters and disorders. But these laws are not laws we love. They do not arise from realities. They arise from legislation and are frequently modified to the benefit of the executives. We are not actually ruled by laws that are primarily uh, solutional to our need. We are uh, following laws that legislators hope will help us to keep the peace without understanding why there is no peace and will not be until things change and become lawful. Now, the, left, the ancients left us a great diagram of lawfulness. They gave us a, a wonderful hint. Lord Bacon advanced this, that by assuming definitely that there was a universal intelligence at the source of all things, yet he held some reputation as a scientist, and he proved conclusively that an individual could work definitely and deeply with physics, mathematics, chemistry, and other sciences, and still be a good child of the Church of England. The actual answers that we need do not interfere with, effect, with, with our effectiveness. They simply make this effectiveness real and permanent. They contribute to the solution of things for which we are all seeking some kind of useful answers. So here we are with a universe so built that it is capable of being understood. And we are here to make what some of the ancient peoples called a pilgrimage. Now, the pilgrimage is an ascent through the rungs of the ladder. A pilgrimage is a pattern of growth. It is a pattern of realities. And in Japan and China, the Buddhists make pilgrimages. These pilgrimages are for refreshments, and they are journeys from one sacred place to another with the understanding that through the inward contemplation of the journey, the individual becomes aware of the eternal journey within himself, which must, which must finally bring him home. As uh, we find also in Homer's de definition of the journal journeys of Ulysses, where he says the, gr the great hero of Troy set sail again for his own far distant native land. Well, this far distant native land is, in a sense, the new world a new world of peace and order and integrities, based upon a fact that there are reasons that we are not required to do what other things do because we can see what they do, but we cannot see what we do. We are not expected to take everything on credit. In fact, I think the scientist is more gullible in these respects than the average theologian. The scientist believes anything that another scientist says whereas the theologian believes only the sayings of his own theology. <laughs> so he doubts something. But the uh, more conservative attitude at the moment is to try to break through to something. Now, in the midst of all of these problems, whether it be now or 5,000 years ago, we, say, we see the similar phenomena occurring. Out of the crisis, out of the strife, out of the stress, the pain, the suffering, the war, the pillage, the massacre, the tyrannies, all out of all of these things comes a kind of longing, a yearning in the human heart for peace, a great desire to understand why we are suffering and to find some way of curing this suffering. Uh, but up to now, we haven't realized that we have the suffering and the cure is limited to the same level as the suffering. We have to chart by which we know we suffer, but the chart of remedies is based upon the same chronology. We are working on one level to have the problem and cure it at the same time. Now, in the old ways of thinking, it couldn't do it that way. The old way was if you have a problem on a level, you must cure it by going to one level above it. You must outgrow something to escape the consequences of your own mistakes. You cannot simply ask the government to pass another rule to supply more food for the homeless. This is all very important physically, but it's still physical. And it will never solve the solved problem. There will always be hunger until we find the cause of it 
and not merely try to feed the hungry. We have to know the reasons for these things. We have to know that our dilemmas result from our own abuses, our abuses of knowledge, abuses of skill. Science, in some cases, has actually given us the knowledge we need, but we even abuse that knowledge. We are unwilling to recognize the larger picture, the larger destiny of things. And in because of this restriction and limitation, evils go uncorrected generation after generation, and war follows war in painful frequencies. But actually, we are the masters of these things. We make them. We cause them. But we do not know how to cure them. Now, it may well be also that in a time of this kind that the new rising mind of the public is going to begin to investigate. In the last, uh, I would say, five or ten years, the interest in transphysical things has increased a hundredfold. In every community, there are now persons questioning the mistakes that are being made and also seeking desperately to find an answer and finding that this answer cannot be found by increasing the police force or getting more firemen or by creating some type of refuge for the hungry. These things may be necessary, but they must be outgrown in favor of something that is permanent, real, and inevitable. So out of the great diagram of the ancients, of the perfectly ordered universe, with its septenary ladder, with all of its hierarchies and orders, a world of mysteries as set forth in such great dramas as Dante's Inferno, Milton's Paradise Lost, and Gator's Faust. These are all archetypal dramas playing to the factors that are behind the mortal way of doing things. They tell us of a universe of causes. Now we may not want to feel or believe that somewhere up in the sky there is a world like the one described by John in the Apocalypse. We may not want to see a throne in front of a crystal sea with 24 elders bowing before it. But there again we are in trouble for a very simple reason. Those are symbols, not the reality. They are keys. The, de the designs, the scenes, the situations <coughs> represented in the spheres of redemption are not to be taken physically and literally. You cannot make a physical literalism out of a spiritual fact. They have to be into understood intuitively, mystically, apperceptively. They are symbols to be interpreted, not scenic patterns to be copied. And just as these various moral fables are played out in cosmic mysteries, so the individual is expected to have the insight to realize that they are all parts of his own nature which he is seeking to develop and of limitations which he is seeking to overcome. So we get gradually to one concept which I think is very important basically, and that is that there is a pattern, that this pattern is unchanging, that this pattern will not know the 20th century from the 50th. This pattern is the same group of rules as individuals evolve, they will move from one level of these rules to another. But no individual will ever be allowed to function indefinitely in variance with rules. He has to finally accept them. And by accepting them, vanquish them. By overcoming them, perfecting himself by means of these rules. Now, in uh, those of you who have ever been in a Muslim mosque, will realize that in the courtyard of the mosque there is always a pool of water. Uh, this pool of water, like the uh, Jewish uh, mystery of the, ta of the bowl on the uh, shoulders of the twelve oxen, this bowl or this, uh, uh, this pond is a symbol of purification with purification. The highest physical aspect of existence is the purification of physical life. Purification means the removal from that life of everything that is contrary to life and anything that is a cause of death, sickness, or destruction. The to cleanse means to outgrow those defects which impair the person and endanger his world. 
So the first step always, represented in this case by the moon, is purification, the lowest rung of the ladder. All things must become clean, clean inwardly, clean morally, clean and simple and honest in their dealings with each other. Purity in this case means overcoming ulterior motives, overcoming all of the negative criticisms and evil thoughts which offend the, the, the law as well as our neighbor, and also to realize that this is the first step and that no one can take the second step until he passes the first one. So the search inwardly for the mystery of the seven-rung ladder has to begin with the individual bringing his material, physical life into order. Smarter people like to jump right past that and go on to something better. But unless it is conquered, there is no receptivity to something better. The individual who has not corrected his faults will not be happy by lifting them to another level. He will keep right on having his faults. So the first step of the first rung of the ladder was purification. It was the process of bringing the life into harmony with natural law. It was to make it, the world a natural garden, as it was intended to be, in which all things lived together in peace, and everything was mutually supporting all other things. This land of uh, personal purification is a matter of quite a little th serious thought for most people. One of the best ways is to th sit down, figure out what your most obvious failings is, uh, are, and then, dividing them up, make a little slip of paper and say, I have a rather quick temper. I'm not very patient. So for the next 30 days, I will work with patience. I will try to discover why I am impatient, and I will also discover why I am punished for impatience. If I am sufficiently impatient, I will have nervous ailments. If it gets too bad, I may have to go to a counselor. If it still gets even worse, it will break my home. All these things will have to be taken into consideration. But there is no cure except to change, to grow up into a realization of the value. To fight yourself into a control is no good, unless inwardly your consciousness supports that control. It has of no value to you or anything that you are doing. There is no way of getting away except by correcting the fault. Correcting it because we want to grow, not because the fault is a delightful thing we would like to enjoy whenever the occasion arises. When someone offends us, we want to be offended, and we want to show it. So then there are two offenses one by the other person and one by ourselves. They are in trouble for what they have done, and we are in trouble because we have been unable to maintain our own integrity in the presence of pressure. So all the way along, we take the physical things first. Now, the physical things are laws, society. The physical things are marriage and home and family and parents and business. All these things have got to be redeemed. That is, they've got to be straightened out. It doesn't mean that we have to give up everything and become wanderers in the desert. It means that we have to try to use things and not abuse them, trying to find out how to be the greater good to all concerned for the growth and unfoldment of internal faculties. So this goes on until the person can really honestly say that he is no longer hating anything or anyone, that he is no longer out to cheat somebody, that he has no longer the determination to commit a crime against society because of his own personal dissatisfactions. If he gradually understands, then comes the point. To understand, he must begin to learn. He must begin to be aware that there are laws. He has to recognize that he is not making a reformation of himself simply because of something he doesn't understand. The physical solution to it is health. If it is bad for his health, then it's wrong. If it is bad for his associations, if it breaks up the normal experiences of living, if it puts penalties upon others that they do not need, 
then it is not good. But he has to find out for himself how to improve this situation. Now, as he gets a little further along, he comes again into a new, onto a new rung of the ladder. And this rung is supposedly governed by the god Mercury. And Mercury is communication. Um, uh, Mercury is also intelligence. Now, Mercury is not philosophy. Mercury is the kind of intelligence that we get in a public school system. Mercury is the training of the mind for the purpose of adjustment with circumstances and conditions. So we come now to the second rung of the ladder, and that is education. Education must become the source of certainties for us. Education must help us to have strength to make the changes that we need to make in order to accomplish it, the goals which we are presumed to accomplish. Therefore, education must lead us to idealism and not to materialism. Education must help us to understand the divine plan for things and not accept as inevitable human mistakes. We have to use education to find out what is worth knowing, how to find out what does the most to help us to be constructive, useful people. The mind gives us certain faculties upon which we can build and by which we can grow. But we have to in all ways uh, find the inspiration, the integrities to make these adjustments useful and permanent in our lives. After we decide how to be educated, then we have to find out how to use education. An education that uses only our physical faculties for the maintenance of our physical securities is not adequate. Education must make us citizens of the whole great wheel of life. It must cause us to become potential citizens of a universal world, a world that extends beyond the stars. We should be recognize ourselves as parts of a vast plan and not as poor suffering individuals deserted by everything, including time. This is the second type of, think, of thought. Then we come to the, the rulership of the third rung of the ladder, which is Venus. Now, Venus is emotional maturity. It is the re revelation of the emotional beauty factor. It governs affection. It governs beauty. It governs all of those impulses which arise from the sublimities of existence. It is also a, a sincere affair. The great keynote of Venus is sincerity, that all emotions must be true, must be real, must be right, that all emotions must lead the individual to a higher degree of insight and, if necessary or possible, impel others to self-improvement. In other words, the, the satisfaction of affections is the proper use of our feelings of unity, of, of responsibility, and of all those natural relationships which are part of our third step of initiation, so to say. In other words, we have to cleanse the inside of the emotional cup. We have to purify our lives. We do not become ascetics. We do not become monastics. We become kindly people using the, the powers that we possess as they were intended. All misuse is tragedy. Things must be as they should be. And that takes the next rung of the ladder, and that next rung is the sun. Of course, the ancients considered the sun to be a planet. This was not true, but for their analogy of the purpose they were working with, it was suitable until other planets were discovered. And the sun, is, therefore, comes to be the life giver. The sun is the, is the contribution of each individual to the eternal growth of things. It is the problem of bringing life and light to others. It is service. It is protection. It is the necessary sacrifice of self-interest for the good of all things. The Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten worshipped or venerated the divine power in the form of a sunball. Each of the rays of the sun ending in a human hand, these hands intended to lift up the holy, 
lift up the sad, lift up the imperfect, and to rescue all life from the restrictions of ambition and things of this nature. Therefore, it was the problem of the son that the individual becomes a son on this level of uh, integration and therefore must give his light to the whole world and must never in any way fail to share those good values which he has uh, as light of morality, light of integrity, light of comfort, consolation, and pity. All these things belong to the sharing of life one with another. After this has been more or less well accomplished, we pass to Mars, and this is one that most people will have a great trouble with. It is high on the level of, uh, of initiation rites because it would be impossible to accomplish it without considerable previous growth. But Mars is competition. Mars is mutual destruction for profit. Mars is the desperate effort to overwhelm, overcome, or dominate something. Now, in nations, this causes war after war and is one of the most destructive factors there is in human life. But most always, also, it is a symbol of domination in little things, domination in a home, domination in business, domination in the community, even domination in theology. All domination, all effort to bind by force, others to slavery to us or our purposes, our ambitions, the sacrifice of the life of the child in order that the child may fulfill our ambitions. All of these things come under Mars. Mars is a more or less active, somewhat destructive force, but it is also the basis of courage. It is the basis, basis of willingness to sacrifice self for the common good. It is sometimes the sign of the martyr, but it is always the sign constructively of the struggle for peace, the continuance of the determination to do what is right even in the midst of great adversity. So Mars gives us the inspiration or the identity which makes it possible for us to fight the good fight, which is the fight against darkness, the fight against ignorance, the fight against death but not the fight against man or the law. And the peace comes at the end of this kind of struggle because understanding and insight become stronger than strife. And until our understanding is stronger than strife, there will be no peace in the world. That takes us to the next problem, and that is Jupiter. Now Jupiter, of course, was the father of Zeus, was the father of the gods. Zeus has come down to us in our thinking as the symbol of great intellectual maturity. Zeus is judgment. It is also uh, the basis of all higher philosophical dedications. Zeus is the righteous ruler, but Zeus is also a symbol of that ruler which is the part of ourselves. Gradually we have gotten ourselves away from the domination of faculty faculties, sensory perceptions, and the lower parts of consciousness. We come finally to Jupiter. Jupiter is the symbol of a strange kind of majority. Jupiter is the worldly wise. It knows all things that are necessary to know, except that it will never be able to solve the mystery of itself. Jupiter, therefore, is a wisdom in which worldly wisdom has been blended with divine wisdom. And if this blending is proper and complete, then uh, Jupiter becomes the symbol of the philosophic elect. A philosophical person is not one who knows more than his neighbor, but one who lives better than his neighbor and helps to possible to bring his neighbor into peace. Now, Jupiter also points out that there will always be leadership of some kind in this world that no matter what we do, no time will come when everyone is exactly the same. And in the interim by which we must climb this ladder, there will be many times in which leadership becomes important. And therefore, the great problem arises in the name of the Jupiterian leadership. The Jupiterian leader, no matter how much power it has, will never abuse that power in any way. The Jupiterian leader will never fail to work, first of all, for the good of the lead, 
for those he leads. The Jupiterian leader also has a deep religious insight. No good leader can be an atheist. He cannot hope to solve the people's problems unless in his own heart he has blended the intellect and the spiritual faculties of the human constitution. The leader must therefore be enlightened. And an enlightened leader is one above any action which is not honorable. The, the leader responsibility is heavy. And instead of using leadership as a symbol of opportunity to exploit, really leadership is the privilege of service. It is the privilege of doing things for other people to make life better for them and for the world in which they live. The unselfish leadership is the highest aspect and therefore becomes the sixth level of the cycle. And then comes the last, Saturn. And Saturn was the ancient father who, who devoured all his own sons. It was a very interesting legendary behind Saturn. Saturn is a symbol of a very deep composure. Saturn is a f the final statement of a maturity blending inside spiritual enlightenment with material adjustments. Saturn is therefore the symbol of that balance which when achieved makes the individual almost indestructible. Saturn is that which has no longer any breakage with law. It has no longer any conflict with realities. Therefore, in the more common uh, feelings of astrology, Saturn is the restorer of long life. This means simply that it has reached the point where it does not cause short life to itself. It has kept the rule. It has met, made the dedications. It has the profound attitudes and yet the simplicity and directness of revelation. So Saturn represents the truly wise person, the philosophic elect, the sage, the person who has lived the life and has now become the teacher of others. It is the religious symbol of leadership. It is the power to become the good shepherd and carry forward the labors of, of sharing wisdom. It is from the Saturn level that the great leaders of peoples should be chosen leaders who would be incapable of leading a people into war, a leader that would be incapable of permitting discord and dissension of, a, of an unreasonable nature from arising within his empire, so that the one who would be the greatest among us must be the servant of all, and that is the position of Saturn. All greatness is, is service. All elevation is for the service of those who must obey the laws of leadership. So there can be no mistake, no fallacies, no corruptions possible in this pattern of things. Now if the individual has followed this line through, he then comes as the Egyptian mystery shows and the Eleusinia and the Bacchic and Osarian mysteries. He comes into the presence of the Great One. In this sense, in Egypt, we follow very closely the story in the Apocalypse of John. But we come to the great figure walking among the candlesticks, carrying the stars. This is a symbol of that which is above these limitations. This is a release in which the individual, having step by step overcome the impediments which he has placed upon himself, or has permitted to society to place upon him the wrong education and wrong laws, that the uh, individual comes into the presence of Osiris in Egypt and comes into the presence of the Lord with the stars and the candlesticks. And in every religion there is some, whether it is Shanti in China or whether it is Mahavarakana in J Buddhist Japan, all of these symbols represent coming face to face with the truth. Coming face to face with the thing that it is that is as it is. I am that I am. And this uh, tremendous experience was represented in the mysteries by the psychostasia or the weighing of the soul. 
Here it was that having passed all uh, tests and obligations, having fulfilled the discipleships of the mystery rites, having learned all that was possible to be taught by illumined and initiated teachers, the individual comes straight into the presence of that which is his own destiny. Now, if this occurs and the individual reaches the highest degree of initiation physically, he becomes a, an ahat or a lohan or an adept in the uh, t- terminology of different religions. He then becomes one who knows. Now, as one who knows, the very fact of knowledge brings with it the first great burden that knowledge must bear. But now that he knows, he must give and share knowledge. He must go forth in the name of knowledge and in the name of service to become a a, a a depending force in the development of other people. He must become a part of the hierarchy or the order of leadership which is behind the administration of universal law on the physical plane. Because the laws themselves are not physical, it is only an individual who has transcended the physical in his own life and has become the ahead, who is capable of interpreting something above the physical for the needs of those who are still bound by the physical. Again, it is a a problem of proper instruction, and the adept, having received that instruction, is capable of sharing it. So little by little, The journey upward brings the creation uh, to the adoration of the creating power. It stands in the presence of the infinite, and in this standing forth in its eternity, uh, the the creation from the smallest to the greatest part, from the smallest gnat in the sunbeam to the vastest of all universal systems. All these things are parts of the unfoldment of one tremendous principle. And this principle is the gradual unfoldment of the infinite through the finite, and the gradual victory of the infinite over the finite, and the final union again of the finite and the infinite in an eternal bond of identity. All of this makes a very interesting and uh, illuminating series of discoveries, which we have to make as we can, little by little. But the Buddha said on one occasion that the longest journey begins with a single step, and this is more or less the problem that we face. We are all of us on this journey, whether we know it or not, and we are going to be unhappy on the journey until we learn that it is the journey that can make us happy. But we have to make the first step. We have to make a dedication. We have to indicate by bringing a burnt offering to the altar of the Lord, as described in the tabernacle rites. We must bring a gift uh, to the altar as a proof of sincerity. And the only gift that anyone can really give is himself. We have to, therefore, sacrifice the self-rulership in order to come under the heading of divine rulership. Now, self-rulership for most people is rulership by the ego, by the personal self, by the individuality, by one of the lesser powers of life. But when we lift this rulership from the personal equation, when we no longer say, I want this and I will do that, and we gradually find out the truth of these things, we then realize that this leadership is always vested finally in the pious part of our own natures. Now, as the various elements of the pattern of the seven steps have unfolded in ourselves, we finally shift the leadership of our lives from the mind, from the ego, to the divine principle abiding always within ourselves. For just as surely as a supreme power fashions all things, so the spark of that supreme power has fashioned us and is finally the ruler of our lives. Therefore, the uh, the initiate ascending always finds in the end 
communion with the innermost, communion with that which is the divine within himself or herself, the rulership of that which was the source and cause, and the only answer to all the questions of life. There is only one reality in each of us, and that is the divine power. And each in his own way must pay homage to that power. And each out of his own struggles, his own labors, and his own works must build a temple which is to be the dwelling place of that one power. So each individual is building his own sanctuary through purification, through discipline, through service, and through all those things which make life real. Now in our present day, in looking around, it doesn't look very much like this is getting along very well. There's nothing but problems, nothing but sorrows, nothing but difficulties. But I think we notice, I think we all notice, that in the last few years, these difficulties are beginning to create legitimate questions. They are the first step in the realization that these difficulties can never cease until we cure them. We have been waiting for something else to cure them. We have been waiting for the angels to come down and take away our misfortunes. We have tried to escape through everything from cursing to praying, but the problems still remain. And they will remain until we recognize the real answer. We are worried about nuclear fission. We are worried about uh, various types of restriction and limitation of growth. We are worried about the earth getting tired, of the petroleum, petroleum resources going out. We don't know what to do with our waste and garbage. All these things are problems. And we are all a little bit dazed by them. But the reason we are dazed is very simple. We want to solve all these problems, and we need to. But we want to do it without making any change in our basic attitude toward life. We wish to remain highly competitive people. We wish to place wealth above every other consideration. We want to honor those who dishonor us. We want to do everything that we always have done without interference of law or order. We want to be happy, but we do not want to change. And yet our, our attitudes and our conducts are why we are unhappy. Now, is there supposed to be some kind of a scientific discovery coming along that will solve all this? I remember when there was great talk about the automobile that was going to solve and end forever cruelty to horses. Well, it didn't exactly work out as it was intended. But we are always in the presence of some kind of a repair. But we do not recognize that we cannot cure this physical problem from the level of the problem. We cannot cure war by simply fighting war. We cannot get war out of the physical world unless we do something to change the physical world, either in nature or in ourselves. We cannot get better without becoming a little bit more virtuous. So in this problem and struggle, we have to face that this mysterious circular diagram with the seven circles represents not only the cycle of growth, but it represents the level of problems that have to be overcome one by one. But there can be no problem overcome unless the cause of it is outgrown. And it is outgrown not by ages of suffering, but by proper intelligent education. We have to be taught the laws of life. We have to be taught the ways of living. And we should start with young people. Our ancestors with a simple faith in God and with children who obeyed, in principle at least, the simple ways of their ancestors. The problem was not very serious. But now it is becoming the proof that infirmities build up, the corruptions multiply, and we have come to a time where we have simply gone too far in the ignoring of value. And we cannot do this indefinitely. Socialized states are beginning to discover they cannot handle their own states unless they are able to do something ethical or religious to enlighten and hold the attention of people to self-improvement or national or world improvement. We cannot keep on breaking the rules and enjoying 
uh, the joys of a good life. So as we sit down trying to study this a little bit, we, why don't we just also look back a little? Read something that Paracelsus wrote. Read something of Neoplatonism, Monasticism. Read something of Buddhism. H.G. Wells said that Buddhism was probably the most important moral doctrine the world ever had. And the Buddhist philosophy of life is very, very simple. Serve the good. Refrain from evil. Purify the mind. This was the basis of that entire religion which moved at one time across the face of Asia. We are all now looking to find out how to improve the present situation. And the first thing we have to do is to put together all the analogies, all of the overwhelming parallels that we can see in every level of life. And from these, get a new vision of law and find out that we are in a universe of law and order and that we are the ones that are out of order. And until we correct this condition, there will be no permanent improvement. That's it.